So originally I wasn't going to film this portion of it. it. It's pretty basic and cut and dry. I'm taking them off the form. Now that they've dried, I'm putting some glue on the overlap, clamping it down and letting it close. But the contrast that I had, I've got two that I put on these oval forms and then the one that I bent by hand and it was pretty much the same size. It was the same size laugh. Everything was about the same except for the actual form. And I discovered something really interesting. One of the things that has been kind of a long-term constant question is, were they glued or were they only stitched together? And every time I pulled them off of the forms, I ran into a problem in that there was a lot of spring back. The inherent strength of the wood caused the overlap to open back up didn't take a really solid. I tried leaving them in the forms longer. It didn't seem to help a whole lot. Every time I would open up a form, after they dried, it would pop open. So I would get a great big deal here, and now i got to clamp that down. So this morning, when I opened up the one that I got by hand, and took a look at it, I had almost no spring back. The actual inherent, just being able to manipulate the wood by hand, compress a little bit more so that when it sprung, sprung back out, the amount that it did seems to be much lessened. This is the worst of the three. This one's a little bit better, but the one I did by hand, not a problem whatsoever. And I actually noticed it when I did this one as well. Again, this was my single entry piece. This one was actually split, cut, plane to thickness all completely by hand and then bent without a form. And this one is not glued, it's just laced down. And you can see it's raised up a little bit here and there's a little bit of a gap, but it actually goes together a lot nicer than some of the ones without gluing it. So I found it just a really fascinating kind of piece of uh, uh, evidence here that I'm on the right track with maybe not using the forms and just gluing by hand by how snug this was without any glue whatsoever. I have glued everything up and it's now fully dried and ready to move on to the next step, except for the one that I did by hand. That one I left, I'm not gluing it. I'm gonna go with it as a purely period attempt as much as possible. For the ones that are glued, I've got a couple of steps next. I'm gonna check them and make sure that they're flat and see if this one is not. So what I'll do for that is I'll go through and I'll take a hand plane and I will just work my way around here until I get it flat. Uh, sometimes it expands a little unevenly or in this case uh, where the sap is sticking up, there's also a little bit of glue there just so it's nice and flat. Once I'm at this point, I'll take a flat board that I'm gonna to use to make my base and I will go in and I will trace it out so that it's the exact shape. There's a couple of different ways I can do that so that it's either completely hidden inside uh, or I can trace the outside and then cut a groove around there so that it's partly uh, inside but it's also flush with the outside. It makes a nice strong joint and it's a little bit better aesthetically. Uh, once I get to that point with these, I'll do the same thing that I'm going to do here. And what I'm going to do with this one is, as you can see here, I've marked it. I've gone in about a quarter inch from the edge on the outside, but also on the inside overlap, and then marked an additional quarter inch. And what I'm going to do next is I'm going to take a piece of this bark here. <clears throat> this is from a locally sourced cedar tree. and. What I'll do with it is I'm actually going to go through and I'm going to peel down the bark until I've got the outer bark separated off. And then I will cut a strip about a quarter inch wide all the way down. This has been soaking in water, plus it's still green, so it cuts really nicely. <coughs> Excuse me. Once I've got to this point, I'm going to go ahead and strip it down to the layers that I need. So as you can see, this is really soft and flexible. So I'm going to take my knife and very carefully, I'm going to insert it here. And I just want to get in there and I kind of want to split it down. I'm trying to take off the entirety of the outer layer of the bark. So what I want is the outer layer of the inner layer of bark, if that makes any sense. You can see there's still a slight color differential here. And I want about a three inch long piece. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to cut it. 
like I said, it's been soaking, so it's nice and pliable. Plus the wood itself, it's bark, it's nice and soft. So I'm just gonna take, and I'm gonna shave that down a little bit, get it a bit thinner. Not an exact science, I'm, I'm going by feel here. I'm also kind of watching the grain of the wood to see that it's all on the same layer as much as I can. And it's still really thick for what I want. I want it to be roughly half of that. So from then what I'll start doing is I'm gonna scrape it to make sure that I've got it down all in that single layer. And then I am going to very carefully try and split that in half. I've got it mostly there. So now I want to peel it, taking off as much of this inner layer as I can. And you can direct the split a bit by pulling more on one side or the other to kind of channel it to where you want it to go. So now I've got it. This one's nice and really thin, but I can feel with my fingers on it. And you can see from there right here that it's, it's not all on one layer. So I'm gonna kind of, again, I'm just gonna really gently plane it with the knife to try and get it as flat as possible in a uniform thickness so it bends well. Um, and then I'm gonna go through by hand. And if you can see here where it's starting to crack, those cracks are actually the outer layer that I still need to take off. So by bending it, I'm breaking that up so it comes off a little easier, but I'm also preconditioning it to go in the wood and add it pre-bent so it doesn't snap on me. So as I said earlier, I marked these spots here, and this is where I'm going to be going through. I've got a mark here that's about an inch down from the top, and a mark here that's about an inch and a half because of the thickness of the board. I want it roughly centered, um, which should work pretty well to space it out and be aesthetically pleasing. I might actually move this down a little bit more because again, I'm gonna put a lid on this later on. So I'll probably move that one down about a half inch. Uh, there's a couple of different ways to do this. You can drill a hole in it on both sides and then connect it with the knife, or you can take your knife and you can just start working it down in there until you've got a slot going all the way through. So I'm gonna go ahead and get those slots prepared uh, off camera and then we'll come back to lace it. So this is a reproduction uh, of an auger, of a, well, a spoon bit or an auger uh, gimlet. They have different names depending on sizes. Uh, this is what I'll use to actually bore the hole here. And the way I'm gonna do that, it's pretty simple. It is just gonna get put there and I'm just gonna rotate it back and forth as it slowly carves itself a hole. You can see here, being a hole, it's not all the way through yet, so I'm going to keep going until voila, we're now all the way through. So I drilled both holes, and now I'm going to take my knife. Uh, it's a nice, fine bladed little knife. Got this one in Sweden, I really love this knife. And basically, I am going to go back and forth, taking little slivers out to connect both sides of the hole. So I'm just going to take a little bit out at a time. A little bit at a time until it's completely free and I've got a slot going all the way across. So I've cut two slots now and I've got my lacing material here. I went ahead and smoothed it out a little bit because once these go in they're not coming out and I don't want those pencil lines to show be shown. So I'm going to come in from the back. I'm going to go into the hole. I'm going to leave myself a bit it up out of the way and then just come down super easy these are nice and supple so I'm gonna pull it tight bend that out of the way again and then I'm gonna go back to the top slot work it through. I have now looped over that piece that's kind of locked itself in place and come back through again. I 
And then I've now got a loop holding it in place. And on the inside, this one is locked down nicely. That one, not so much. However, the fact that there is so much resin in here, it's gonna kind of act like glue a little bit. It's also, once these dry, they should stiffen up and hold it in place really well. So I will complete the other four, or the other three on here, and then I'll set this aside for a few days and just let it dry and do its thing. Okay, so I've gotten all four done. They are laced up, good to go. I'm gonna go ahead and take the moment of truth here and actually take the clamp off. And it's actually holding pretty well. So from here, this one is got a bit of a rock to it. So like I said, I'll need to take a plane and clean it up so it's flat. And then I'll trace it on the base, or on, on a piece of wood to make the base. Once I've got the base in, I will actually cut another piece of wood another lath about this same thickness and then use the form itself the box itself as the form to wrap it around so to make the lid i get it like this here this one's a little tight there we go and then i will do the same thing with the lid i'll flip it upside down i'll put it on top of another piece of wood and i'll make the lid that way so at this point, we've got the body done and laced, and I've got a ring made to go for the lid. So now we need to see about going about making the lid and the base for the box. Now for that, I'm just gonna use a plain old plank of pine for that. In this particular case, this one has got so many knots and just defects in it that I couldn't use it to bend, but it works really well for the base. It's also bowed. And while that's normally a problem and it's not something I'd want to deal with, it actually works well for this particular project. A lot of the archaeological evidence that we find shows that the inside portion is actually domed. What I've found in the past and attributed that to is carving that plank out with an axe. As you're thinning it, you're holding it a bit of an away from the edge, so you end up taking angled cuts all the way around so it ends up with a dome shape. In this particular case, I'm gonna put the ring on the body of the box and I'm gonna flip it upside down and then I'm gonna use a pencil and I'm just gonna trace around the inside of the ring. Now the reason that I do it this way, with both of them connected, is because the base can actually distort the shape of the box. So you wanna go ahead and get the actual shape with it together this way so that everything kind of works in harmony with each other. And then I'll just take, once I've got this done, I'll do the exact same thing. I will flip it over. I don't mind the knot holes, but I kind of want to make sure that I'm not cutting through any of them as I'm going the base. And then I'll just cut it out. So I went ahead and I used the scribed lines and I cut a top and I cut a bottom. Normally I'll cut them just to the outside of the line and then I'll kind of work my way in with a rasp or sanding to get it as close as possible to get a nice tight fit. Uh, I don't usually use glue for the top or the bottom. I do, however, peg them. So this is still a nice, very tight fit. I'll make sure that my lid is flush all the way around. And then I will go in and I will drill in, put in a dowel. Uh, for this one, there normally you'd use a, a spoon bit or a possibly some kind of a, um, with a gimlet handle to it. I don't currently have one of those. I'm still trying to find one. So I'm kind of forced to use what I've got on hand for the modern drill bit. The strange thing about these is that normally it's an asymmetrical uh, arrangement. There normally are five pegs, most common. You'll find one kind of dead center and then the rest spread out more or less on both the top and the bottom. Uh, in my case, the best way I found for it is to use a fairly small dowel, uh, about a 5 64ths, also known as a toothpick. Works really well. So I'll come in and I'll go down uh, about a quarter of an inch or so. I'll drill in just a little bit and then I will angle my hole up and come out through the top. Uh, and Grabbing a chisel, I'll use that. I'll slice the toothpick in half. It's a small dowel. 
I like toothpicks because they're already pointed, so they go in the hole really nicely. It's really easy. And then I can just tap them home. Until they're coming out the top as well. Lay it flush, back and forth, and cut my dowel off. Flush with the face. And now I've got a dowel on lid. I'll do that, four more on the lid, five on the base, and then after that, it's just a matter of a little bit of cleanup and some oil, and I'm done. And we're done. Uh, and now I have pegged in the top and the bottom, so it's all one complete piece. It fit together, I touched up the outside a little bit, smoothed it out, rounded all the edges to prevent uh, breaking and fraying, and I put a coat of uh, boiled linseed oil on it. Historically speaking, there is no real evidence of finish of that nature on it. Um, we use oil and uh, polyurethane, things like that, to protect things, and also to enhance the grain and bring out the, the, the figure of the wood, which doesn't seem to have been a medieval aesthetic at all. Um, especially in this case, if you look at the, the grain of this particular box, the Features that make it possible, that smooth, even, straight grain all the way around, makes it really kind of boring to look at. So it's not really something you want to look at a whole lot. You're not going to enhance the grain. If it would have been decorated at all, there are some examples of boxes that have been painted uh, and decorated that way. Um, there's a couple of examples that have been carved with uh, for, you know, some shallow lines to make geometric patterns and such on it. But um, in this particular case, this one's it's pretty much a, a done deal for me. Um, I'm, uh, we, we tend to use our uh, equipment a little bit differently. We take it uh, long distances in varying weather conditions. So it does need a little bit of that protection modernly for traveling distances when we're having the wood expand and contract much faster than it normally would by being in a home environment or being transported by foot or by carriage or by horse. So it it's, ties in with our modern aesthetic as well as providing protection for our modern lifestyle. One of the other considerations for leaving it this way without any further embellishment is, again, if we look back at the illuminations that we've got examples of or the paintings that we find them, they are just bare wood more often than not. We'll see them up under the benches, we'll see them on shelves or tucked away in various places, and it's just a plain bare wood finish. So this particular look does better in keeping with the aesthetics that we're seeing from the examples that we have through illumination. Um, this pretty well reaches a, a culmination for me. At this point, I've answered a lot of the questions that I had on hows and whys. I, I have a plausibly uh, medieval uh, method of construction with tools that would have been appropriate to the time with construction methods with materials so I am I am kind of shifting my focus from here on out more towards uh, further uh, process rather than um, research of maybes uh, looking for those birch roots if I can find them to replace the cedar bark that I've got in here. The cedar bark is doing a good job, but a birch root is in effect wood as opposed to the bark, which is a lot more fibrous. So that birch root is gonna actually serve to, it's gonna tighten up and harden. It's gonna be stronger and more long lasting. And it's also gonna take the abrasion of opening and closing and rubbing a whole lot better. So looking into that, looking into getting some more period drills to get through in the angle that I need to do them at. Uh, is also another step which means finding someone who can machine that for me uh, or possibly breaking out the forge and learning how to do it myself um, and again continuing to learn how to read lumber so that i know what i'm looking at when i find the raw lumber to split out usable blanks and further refining my process and getting farther away from using modern tools until i'm comfortable in turning out a consistent and um, correct look of finished product. So I'm pretty happy with this one. 
Uh, thank you for, uh, for taking the time to watch my videos. If you have any questions, I would love to discuss the process with you and answer any questions you have. The more that are, of us that are out here doing this, the more knowledge there is to spread. Uh, perhaps you'll find out something that I don't and enhance my knowledge. So I look forward to hearing from you.